All right, we are now live. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for those of you that are here. Even the front row people, I suppose, will appreciate them as well. Um, good to have everybody here. This is that weird time of year where I think between last minute, the, the vacation thing, if you have kids, your vacations end by September. What I'm finding is among the retired folks, the vacation season extends just a little bit further. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure if it was the brain brought everybody in or the subject matter. Yeah, I don't, well, we're talking, you know, they missed sex, which was highly disappointing, so now we'll talk about marriage, the unfortunate consequence, of, I mean, uh, the uh, natural conclusion thereof. Um, sorry, I'm going to keep drinking my Coke. Finally got my new bed delivered, has nothing to do with the lectures, but I've finally gotten two nights of decent sleep, so I've been a happy man. Past two weeks, no good sleep. Two nights, great sleep. Except, you know what? They make these beds so fancy now. They can tell you all about whether you're getting good sleep, how your heart rate's going, whether... You, yeah, it's got all the bells and whistles on it, and I had to laugh because it, it'll show you a chart like you've got this much good sleep and you were restless at these times. And I figured out part of the problem was one of my cats was up on the bed and was very affectionate to everybody and was <laughs> needing Julie and jumping over on my side and he would not settle and I kind of eventually figured out that probably it's telling me I got restless sleep because I kept picking up the cat and throwing him down to the end of the bed. So, so this is kind of like the code reader for the human body. Yeah, it's a little weird. I still don't know quite how I feel about it at this point. I'm like, okay, it's there, it's doing it, and then the other paranoid part of my brain is like, why do we need all this information? I've already got a CPAP machine telling me everything I'm breathing or not breathing. Now I've got the bed telling me the other side of it. It's, uh, I'm getting old fast, and it's really weird, but uh, I feel like they should develop a cat setting you know something on it like click if you own cats and at least that way if things hop on the bed in the middle of the night and trot around they'll ignore that and as long as I don't move everything is great but nobody tuned in to hear about the adventures of my bed so let's talk about something slightly more relevant uh, I think I've mentioned this before, it's getting harder and harder to find more interesting openers. But I found an interesting article today in Christian History Magazine. It's C.S. Lewis, A Gallery of Family and Friends. So it was kind of like a little sketches of people who, who influenced him, folks that had maybe outsized influences on C.S. Lewis's life. Um, his father, Albert Lewis, son of a Welsh immigrant who found success as a partner in a firm that manufactured boilers and ships, attended college and began a practice as a solicitor in Belfast in 1885. So a Welshman who lived in Ireland. Lewis believed his father's quick mind, eloquence, and love of oratory would have suited him for a career in politics if he had had the means. Albert's favorite pastime was spending an afternoon swapping anecdotes with his brothers, acting them out with great flourish. Albert had filled the Lewis home with books, but his son's interest in fantasy literature was not shared by his parents. If I am a romantic, he wrote, my parents bear no responsibility for it. That sounds very familiar. Don't blame the parents. His mother, Florence Lewis, Daughter of Reverend Thomas Hamilton, rector of the church attended by the Lewises, Flora's talent for mathematics won her a first in the subject at Queen's College, Belfast. Her cool temperament was the antithesis of her husband's emotionality. When she agreed to marry Albert after an eight-year courtship, she wrote to him, I wonder, do I love you? I am not quite sure. I know that at least I am very fond of you and that I should never think of loving anyone else. That sounds like a very analytical <laughs> sort of person. Not necessarily a bad thing, just kind of a, what do I actually mean? 
C.S. Lewis wrote of her family, their minds were critical and ironic and they had a talent for happiness to a high degree. Flora was a voracious reader and wrote magazine articles. She died of cancer when C.S. Lewis was only nine. With my mother's death, he wrote, all that was tranquil and reliable disappeared from my life. <sighs> I'll hold off. We'll do those. Those are kind of interesting to read about the parents. I did it with, are there questions in this class? Okay, cool. Was Lewis the older than the other brother? Let me take a look. He was the younger, referred to his older brother, his older brother, Major Warren Hamilton Lewis. What was the age difference between the two? Dun, 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 I do not know. I don't think it was that big, though. He was born in 1895. When was Lewis born? I thought... This is improv improvisation. This birth. Do, do, do. 1898. So, three year, three, four, yeah. So, not, not significantly, although I know that's approximately where my brother and I sort of land on the scale, like three, three and a half years. And I know when we were little, it was an insurmountable difference. Didn't want him hanging around with me. Didn't want to do what I wanted to do. Didn't want him hanging around and ruining all my toys. Eventually you get over it, but it takes a while. All right, so I just think that's kind of interesting to read these little. Maybe I'll read some more later, but just to get to know some of the people that influenced him and certainly his parents, I mean... God knows we can blame everything we know and do on our parents nowadays. So we are going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we will get into this chapter on marriage. Father, we come before you today, and we thank you for the, for the rain, for the change in seasons, for just everything we're going through right now. We don't always want to thank you while all this is going on, but, you know, it's time for the, the cool, the retreat, uh, to look at the world you created and to sort of understand that everything was made for a purpose. Father, I ask that you just bless us as we come together here to read this book from one of your servants, a great thinker, and just, just help us to come a little closer to you through reading this. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I believe we're headed into second fall. I don't know if anybody has actually checked where we are in the season schedule. We'll get into second fall and possibly then have the last gasps of summer and then move into real fall. Or Depends on the day. <laughs> yeah, because the other day they said South Carolina. Yeah. Well, and I thought I'd been hearing that it's going to be a slightly warmer winter. It may not get as bone-chillingly awful. I heard something on the radio this morning, I think. They were talking about all of the myths of, you know, caterpillar stripes and, and all this stuff, and they said that you know, the years where the pine cones are the thickest is the, are going to be the coldest winters. But then they said, but then El Nino comes along and Throws and everything. All these other things that go into it. And so they have no idea what the winter's going to yeah, be. Yeah, no. They, they have some guesses. They think they understand how it's all going to, to move. But ultimately, there's only one person who really knows what the weather's going to be today. And unfortunately, he's not on my radio. I check. I listen. But the best weather report I ever get is when I stick my head out the door and go, well, crap, it's raining. And then we move on. All right, so we are on chapter 6. And we've gone through, and I mean, it's important to keep in mind that this entire book is talking about Christian behaviors, morality, actions, why do Christians behave the way they do. 
Last week we got into the big discussion about sex and surrounding chasteness, not chastity, which was one of the discussions we had. People are not called to chastity in all situations, but they are called to chasteness. Chasteness. Okay. Um, moving on from that, then, he gets into this week talking about marriage, because marriage is another institution that while the world has it, the Christian view and the world's view has tended to be different although we may find it's starting to get closer and I'm not sure in the good way but we'll see we'll see what he has to say all good need my light I'm an old man here we go I really wanted to do the whole speech from the Princess Bride and start out with marriage. Oh, we met for money, but I couldn't keep the voice up for the whole thing. So if you haven't had a chance yet, go see the Princess Bride. That's just an aside. It's a great movie. It's hilarious. One of Lizzie's favorites. All right, Christian marriage. The last chapter was mainly negative. I discussed what was wrong with the sexual impulse in man, but said very little about its right working. In other words, about Christian marriage. There are two reasons why I do not particularly want to deal with marriage. The first is that the Christian doctrines on this subject are extremely unpopular. The second is that I have never been married myself and therefore can speak only at second hand. But in spite of that, I feel I can hardly leave the subject out in an account of Christian morals. The Christian idea of marriage is based on Christ's words that a man and wife are to be regarded as a single organism, for that is what the words one flesh would be in modern English. And the Christians believe that when he said this, he was not expressing a sentiment, but stating a fact just as one is stating a fact when he says that a lock and its key are one mechanism, or that a violin and a bow are one musical instrument. The inventor of the human machine was telling us that its two halves, the male and the female, were made to be combined together in pairs, not simply on the sexual level, but totally combined. The monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all the other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it and make up the total union. The Christian attitude does not mean that there is anything wrong about sexual pleasure any more than about the pleasure of eating. It means that you must not isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself any more than you ought to try to get the pleasures of taste without swallowing and digesting by chewing things and spitting them out again. As a consequence, Christianity teaches that marriage is for life. There is, of course, a difference here between different churches. Some do not admit divorce at all. Some allow it reluctantly in very special cases. It is a great pity that Christians should disagree about such a question. But for an ordinary layman, the thing to notice is that the churches all agree with one another about marriage a great deal more than any of them agrees with the outside world. I mean, they all regard divorce as something like cutting up a living body, as a kind of surgical operation. Some of them think the operation so violent that it cannot be done at all. Others admit, admit it as a desperate remedy in extreme cases. They are all agreed that it is more like having both your legs cut off than it is like dissolving a business partnership or even deserting a regiment. What they all disagree with is the modern view that it is a simple readjustment of partners to be made whenever people feel they are no longer in love with one another or when either of them falls in love with someone else. Before we consider this modern view and its relation to chastity, we must not forget to consider it in relation to another virtue, namely justice. 
Justice, as I said before, includes the keeping of promises. Now everyone who has been married in a church has made a public solemn promise to stick to his or her partner till death. The duty of keeping that promise has no special connection with sexual morality. It is in the same position as any other promise. If, as modern people are always telling us, the sexual impulse is just like all our other impulses, then it ought to be treated like all our other impulses. And as their indulgence is controlled by our promises, so should it be. If, as I think, it is not like all our other impulses, but is morbidly inflamed, then we should be specially careful not to let it lead us into dishonesty. To this, someone may reply that he regarded the promise made in church as a mere formality and never intended to keep it. Whom then was he trying to deceive when he made it? God? That was really very unwise. Himself? That was not very much wiser. The bride or bridegroom or the in-laws? That was treacherous. More often, I think, the couple or one of them hoped to deceive the public. They wanted the respectability that is attached to marriage without intending to pay the price. That is, they were imposters. They cheated. If they are still contented cheats, I have nothing to say to them. Who would urge the high and hard duty of chastity on people who have not yet wished to be merely honest? If they have now come to their senses and want to be honest, their promise already made constrains them. And this, you will see, comes under the heading of justice, not that of chastity. If people do not believe in permanent marriage, it is perhaps better that they should live together unmarried than that they should make vows they do not mean to keep. It is true that by living together without marriage, they will be guilty in Christian eyes of fornication. But one fault is not mended by adding another. Unchastity is not improved by adding perjury. The idea that being in love is the only reason for remaining married really leaves no room for marriage as a contract or promise at all. If love is the whole thing, then the promise can add nothing. And if it adds nothing, then it should not be made. The curious thing is that lovers themselves, while they remain really in love, know this better than those who talk about love. As Chesterton pointed out, those who are in love have a natural inclination to bind themselves by promises. Love songs all over the world are full of vows of eternal constancy. The Christian law is not forcing upon the passions of love something which is foreign to that passion's own nature. It is demanding that lovers should take seriously something which their passion of itself impels them to do. And of course, the promise made when I am in love and because I am in love to be true to the beloved as long as I live commits me to being true even if I cease to be in love. A promise must be about things that I can do, about actions. No one can promise to go on feeling in a certain way. He might as well promise never to have a headache or always to feel hungry. But what, it may be asked, is the use of keeping two people together if they are no longer in love? There are several sound social reasons. To provide a home for their children. To protect the woman who has probably sacrificed or damaged her own career by getting married from being dropped whenever the man is tired of her. But there is another reason of which I am very sure, though I find it a little hard to explain. It is hard because so many people cannot be brought to realize that when B is better than C, A may be even better than B. They like thinking in terms of good and bad, not of good, better, and best, or bad, worse, and worst. They want to know whether you think patriotism a good thing. If you reply that it is, of course, far better than individual selfishness, but that it is inferior to universal 
charity and should always give way to universal charity when the two conflict. They think you are being evasive. They ask what you think of dueling. If you reply that it is far better to forgive a man than to fight a duel with him, but that even a duel might be better than a lifelong enmity which expresses itself in secret efforts to do the man down, they go away complaining that you would not give them a straight answer. I hope no one will make this mistake about what I am going to say. What we call being in love is a glorious state and in several ways good for us. It helps to make us generous and courageous. It opens our eyes not only to the beauty of the beloved, but to all beauty, and it subordinates, especially at first, our merely animal sexuality. In that sense, love is the great conqueror of lust. No one in his senses would deny that being in love is far better than either common sensuality or cold self-centeredness. But, as I said before, the most dangerous thing you can do is to take any one impulse of our own nature and set it up as the thing you ought to follow at all costs. Being in love is a good thing, but it is not the best thing. There are many things below it, but there are also things above it. You cannot make it the basis of a whole life. It is a noble feeling, but it is still a feeling. Now, no feeling can be relied on to last in its full intensity or even to last at all. Knowledge can last. Principles can last. Habits can last. But feelings come and go. And in fact, whenever people say the state called being in love usually does not last. If the old fairy tale ending, they lived happily ever after, is taken to mean they felt for the next 50 years exactly as they felt the day before they were married, then it says what probably never was nor ever would be true and would be highly undesirable if it were. Who could bear to live in that excitement for even five years? What would become of your work, your appetite, your sleep, your friendships? But of course, ceasing to be in love need not mean ceasing to love. Love in the second sense, love as distinct from being in love, is not merely a feeling. It is a deep unity maintained by the will and deliberately strengthened by habit, reinforced by, in Christian marriages, the grace which both partners ask and receive from God. They can have this love for each other even at those moments when they do not like each other, as you love yourself even when you do not like yourself. They can retain this love even when each would easily, if they allowed themselves, be in love with someone else. Being in love first moved them to promise fidelity. This quieter love enables them to keep the promise. It is on this love that the engine of marriage is run. Being in love was the explosion that started it. If you disagree with me, of course, you will say, he knows nothing about it, he is not married. You may quite possibly be right, but before you say that, make quite sure that you are judging me by what you really know from your own experience and from watching the lives of your friends and not by ideas you have derived from novels and films. This is not so easy to do as people think. Our experience is colored through and through by books and plays and the cinema, and it takes patience and skill to disentangle the things we have really learned from life for ourselves. People get from books the idea that you've been married, try that again. People get from books the idea that if you have married the right person, you may expect to go on being in love forever. As a result, when they find they are not, they think this proves that they have made a mistake and are, and are entitled to a change, not realizing that when they have changed, the glamour will presently go out of the new love just as it went out of the old one. In this department of life, 
as in every other, thrills come at the beginning and do not last. The sort of thrill a boy has at the first idea of flying will not go on when he has joined the RAF and is really learning to fly. The thrill you feel on first seeing some delightful place dies away when you really go to live there. Does that mean it would be better not to learn to fly and not to live in the beautiful place? By no means. In both cases, if you go through with it, the dying away of the first thrill will be compensated for by a quieter and more lasting kind of interest. What is more, and I can hardly find words to tell you how important I think this is, it is just the people who are ready to submit to the loss of the thrill and settle down to the sober interest who are then most likely to meet new thrills in some quite different direction. A man who has learned to fly and become a good pilot will suddenly discover music. The man who has settled down to live in a beauty spot will discover gardening. This is, I think, one little part of what Christ meant by saying that a thing will not really live unless it first dies. It is simply no good trying to keep any thrill. That is the very worst thing you can do. Let the thrill go. Let it die away. Go on through that period of death into the quieter interest and happiness that follow, and you will find you are living in a world of new thrills all the time. But if you decide to make thrills your regular diet and try to prolong them artificially, they will all get weaker and weaker and fewer and fewer, and you will be a bored, disillusioned old man for the rest of your life. It is because so few people understand this that you may find many middle-aged men and women maundering about their lost youth at the very age when new horizons ought to be appearing and new doors opening all around them. It is much better fun to learn to swim than to go on endlessly and hopelessly trying to get back the feeling you had when you first went paddling as a small boy. Another notion we get from novels and plays is that falling in love is something quite irresistible, something that just happens to one like measles. And because they believe this, some married people throw up the sponge and give in when they find themselves attracted by a new acquaintance. But I am inclined to think that these irresistible passions are much rarer in real life than in books, and at any rate, when one is grown up. When we meet someone beautiful and clever and sympathetic, of course we ought in one sense to admire and love those good qualities but it is not very largely in our own choice whether this love shall or shall not turn into what we call being in love. No doubt, if our minds are full of novels and plays and sentimental songs and our bodies full of alcohol, we shall turn any love we feel into that kind of love, just as if you have a rut in your path, all the rainwater will run into that rut. And if you wear blue spectacles, everything you see will turn blue. But that will be our own fault. Before leaving the question of divorce, I should like to distinguish two things which are very often confused. The Christian conception of marriage is one. The other is the quite different question, how far Christians, if they are voters or members of parliament, ought to try to force their views of marriage on the rest of the community by embodying them in the divorce laws. A great many people seem to think that if you are a Christian yourself, you should try to make divorce difficult for everyone. I do not think that. At least, I know I should be very angry if the Mohammedans tried to prevent the rest of us from drinking wine. My own view is that the churches should frankly recognize that the majority of the British people are not Christians and therefore cannot be expected to live Christian lives. There ought to be two distinct kinds of marriage, one governed by the state with rules enforced on all citizens, the other governed by the church with rules enforced by her on her own members. 
the distinction ought to be quite sharp so that a man knows which couples are married in a Christian sense and which are not. So much for the Christian doctrine about the permanence of marriage. Something else even more unpopular remains to be dealt with. Christian wives promise to obey their husbands. In Christian marriage, the man is said to be the head. Two questions obviously arise here. Why should there be a head at all? Why not equality? And two, why should it be the man? One, the need for some head follows from the idea that marriage is permanent. Of course, as long as the husband and wife are agreed, no question of a head need arise, and we may hope that this will be the normal state of affairs in a Christian marriage. But when there is a real disagreement, what is to happen? Talk it over, of course, but I am assuming that they have done that and still failed to reach agreement. What do they do next? They cannot decide by a majority vote, for in a council of two, there can be no majority. Surely only one or other of two things can happen. Either they must separate and go their own ways, or else one or the other of them must have a casting vote. If marriage is permanent, one or the other party must, in the last resort, have the power of deciding the family policy. You cannot have a permanent association without a constitution. Two, if there must be a head, why the man? Well, firstly, is there any very serious wish that it should be the woman? As I have said, I am not married myself, but as far as I can see, even a woman who wants to be the head of her own house does not usually admire the same state of things when she finds it going on next door. She is much more likely to say, poor Mr. X, why does he allow that appalling woman to boss him about the way she does is more than I can imagine. I do not think she is even very flattered if anyone mentions the fact of her own headship. There must be something unnatural about the rule of wives over husbands because the wives themselves are half ashamed of it and despise the husbands whom they rule. But there is also another reason, and here I speak quite frankly as a bachelor, because it is a reason you can see from outside even better than from inside. The relations of the family to the outer world, what might be called its foreign policy, must depend in the last resort upon the man because he always ought to be and usually is much more just to the outsiders. A woman is primarily fighting for her own children and husband against the rest of the world. Naturally, almost in a sense rightly, their claims override for her all other claims. She is the special trustee of their interests. The function of the husband is to see that this natural preference of hers is not given its head. He has the last word in order to protect other people from the intense family patriotism of the wife. If anyone doubts this, let me ask a simple question. If your dog has bitten the child next door, or if your child has hurt the dog next door, which would you sooner have to deal with, the master of that house or the mistress? Or, if you are a married woman, let me ask you this question. Much as you admire your husband, would you not say that his chief failing is his tendency not to stick up for his rights and yours against the neighbors as vigorously as you would like? A bit of an appeaser. Oh, he has a lot to say in that chapter. <sighs> oh, my, my, my. I feel like I've been reading. What time? Ooh. Yeah, sorry, can't take that call. Whew. That's a long chapter. There's a lot there. Um, some of it I'm 100% right on with him on. Some of it I'm like, mm, okay. And some of it I'm like, yeah, come to, come to 2023 and say that out on a street corner somewhere and see how that goes. No, I know, but... It's just funny. I mean, and at that time, keep in mind, the one thing I love in there is when he talks about legislating marriage. 
you know, and he says, well, we know most of the people of Britain at this time are not Christians. And that's 1940-something, 50-something, when did we say? Yeah, yeah, when he first wrote this. He thought it was bad then. Whew, find out now. So, we will start with Christian morality about marriage is based on what? How do we get our morality about marriage? Obviously, the world has its thoughts about marriage. Where did we get ours as Christians? And who does it involve? Us being man and, wife. man and wife. Thank you. So it's like a three party contract, in effect. Mm-hmm. The two people come together, and God. That's the part I really, you know, we had all that talk about sex last week, and we talked about the unitive power in that. You know, we kind of got a little back and forth on the the biological purpose, and we had, you know, to create children, okay. But then there's also these sort of sub things, and there's a unity to it as well. But Scripture tells us the unity really comes when God has joined them together. It's a three-party contract, in effect. You stand up there, you make your vows. We all remember that day, or maybe it's hazy for some of us. It seems to me it went by quickly. I remember mine being very hot. We got married in the church Julie grew up in. They did not have air conditioning. July 1st. It's a hot day that day. If you look at the wedding video, you can see exactly how green my brother turned by the end of the wedding, and he disappeared as soon as the service was over. That's okay. How long is this unity supposed to last? For life. Yeah, God doesn't mess around. God brings the two together. The two of you make the vows. You're together for life. Uh, how, did he, how did he state divorce? What, what did he compare divorce to? Cutting a body in half. Ooh, it's a violent, violent. Do you agree with that assessment? What's it make you feel? What's a, I mean, when you think about it. I, I think we're all at the point now we probably know friends, people who have gotten divorced. Don't think anybody has. I have very few. I don't. Honestly, I don't know of many of my peers. I don't know if I just haven't hit the right time or if I just know very few people. But among my immediate peers, I don't know of any divorces but among sort of the extended group of people I know, sure, I know about some. Now he says it's like cutting off a limb. It's like violence upon the body. Would you agree with that? I mean, it's very close. I can't imagine going through this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you, it's hard when it's people, you know, they, 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 people who are getting divorced will justify it. This is the best thing, you know, if we stay together, we'll have trouble, conflict, it's a problem. And yet, even when they do divorce, it's it's like a stone falling in the water and there's just ripples and there's always ripples. People who are not immediately a party to that marriage feel the impact. I'm, uh, I probably should have prepped this ahead of time. I'm, think, I'm thinking about personal examples from my life and I'm trying to think about whether I should explain them or not. The people that I know would not be watching this, but I mean, we've had people who've divorced, and even though they're not family or not personally part of our family, we've seen it, and it's torn people apart. 
Because suddenly, I mean, what happens to friends? It, it's, I would think it's similar to having a person die. They, you know, they, you've shared a whole lifetime with them, and then yeah. all of a sudden, all those memories, who are you going to share them? Yeah. But how, how does the world view it? Yeah, every the, the happy divorcees, you know what I mean? Happy blended families. Now, now, hear me very carefully here as we talk through this. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying, though, however, that people don't get through it, that lives don't move on, that there isn't forgiveness, and that there isn't, you know, life reconsidered after the divorce, and people find forgiveness and move on. Um, but at the same time, I have to be able to say, it's bad. Um, taking away any personal examples here, I, I think of, uh, so, the world's view of how this works. ABBA. Everybody knows who ABBA is? Music group, 70s, Dancing Queen, Mamma Mia. You know, at one point, they were all sort of married to the other partners. They, they married, I forget which two were married first, the other two married, then they got divorced, and they married the other partners, and then they divorced, and everybody kind of went their separate ways. And they all get along and do their thing sort of now, but it's sort of a weird example of how the world thinks divorce. You know, hey, I don't feel in love anymore. Let's just... Move on, and, and there, you know, you get up and you got to go sing and perform and do your own sort of thing. It's it's a great example. I mean, no, no, no. That just came along. Somebody had a good idea. I could watch that day after day after day after day. But I just I I think they're a good example of how the world kind of views that thing. Um, we know that it's a problem because, now I love this quote, and I, I've never really thought about this until Lewis really started getting into it, but he says marriage vows are promises. When we're thinking about marriage vows, we're talking about justice because we are talking about relationship and promise people do not believe these promises, Lewis said that it's probably better for them to live together without marrying. How do you feel about that? I agree. I agree. Do you? Because yeah. <laughs> if you get a divorce, I mean, if, if the couple was serious from the first year, they planned on being lifetime partners. Mm -hmm. One of the partners breaks that. So, I mean, it's a trust. How do you get through that? No, I don't know. I don't ever plan on it. Nobody ever does, but... Um, it says something about your character, you know? <laughs> yeah, hope. <laughs> yeah, I have only ever used the word divorce within context of mattress shopping. That's the only <laughs> time we've ever... And, and the way I said it was... Well, actually, actually two things. When my wife first got her CPAP machine... I said that prevented the first divorce because she finally could sleep at night without beating me as we're laying there in bed. The second thing was when we went to go shop for the mattress and we found the one that had the variable firmness levels because that would have been the second divorce. I can't live with a soft mattress and she doesn't like a hard mattress. So I've used it in that sense, but you know, some people think about it as a serious option. I've never seen it as a serious option. Um, I don't, it's interesting because for everybody here to say, yep, I agree with it, and I agree, I, I think on an intellectual level he's got a point, um, but I'm not sure on a cultural level people have really always felt that way, or is that a more modern attitude? Depends on what the construct in that culture is about marriage. Maybe. Well, absolutely, yeah. But, like, you know, 
shotgun weddings exist for a reason, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I don't think uh I don't think anybody within the church would want to recommend that two people go ahead and get married when you see the train wreck coming. Slow motion train wreck it ought to be, but um yeah, I get I guess though he also operates within this theoretical world where it's like, well, we just absolutely know the person doesn't want to hold to it. Like, I'll get married, but I'm going to go. I mean, maybe what we're seeing now, maybe it is this plethora of discussions about open marriages. You know, it's the new thing amongst all the young. Get, this is why pastor tells people to stay off TikTok and stay off social media, and then you don't run into these things. But, you know, people who have polyamorous marriages or open marriages or something, you know, they want... Why, why bother you? Well, that's a great question. That's a great question, but it's like this is what the new generation is sort of dealing with and working around, whereas... You want to just be buddies. Buddies with benefits, let's say. <laughs> buddies with benefits. Then be that. BWBs, yeah. <laughs> Don't promise somebody you're going to stay with them the rest of their lives. And yeah, I don't even... I don't even know if they promise them that when they go through those things, but but maybe it's more to this next question. Um, actually, the next question is part of it, but he makes a very big distinction between being in love, you know, the feeling of being in love versus loving, you know, or being loving. Um, he separates that from lust and I don't see the difference. <laughs> well, I I think I, I guess there's some yeah. I think it's the good, better, best. So he, he makes that example about good, better, best. And he's saying that the lust, the animal attraction, we'll we'll call it good, maybe on the slow side of good. Being in love he says is sort of the way the first step to taming that lust you know now you've got the girl you can't take your eyes off of you know you love her you want to hang around with her you want to be there with her but he says the best is really you know being in love you know or, or, or the best is being loving the best is where you're truly looking out for the best of that per person may continue to hold aspects of the being in love but this is no longer the driver we're talking about being loving which doesn't necessarily have to hold to all the thrill and an excitement I mean I most of us some of us met, met our partners when they were younger husbands wives don't know how much younger don't know everybody's story Julie was 16 when I met her I was 18, 19 ish. And the way we felt at that time, I can just say from personal experience, is different from where we, you know, I mean, at that time when we were first together, it's like, I want to be with you all the time. Let's hang out. We were on the phone every night. We were seeing every, nowadays I'm like, look, I'm just going to go sit in my recliner where it's quiet. I'm going to have a little quiet time. Is that good with you? Okay. And she's going to go knit and do something quiet over there. We're, we're good. You know, we're not any less in love. We're still in love. But the feeling changes. And that, that was Lewis's point is this, some people are in love with being in love. And aren't they the worst? Because they've got to go from one to the other to the other because what happens is the excitement, once you hang out for a little while, you're not as excited to see each other. Well, if you're addicted to that feeling, there's a psychological problem. Sure. But the funny part about the whole thing is it doesn't come from a place of badness or evilness. He's not saying that sex is bad. He's not saying that attraction is bad. 
but it's the way it's unbound by promises, that it's, it's being sought for its own sake. That is the point that he's getting at. Now, he talked about the fact, and he said this, and I don't know if anybody else caught it when he said it, because I read it, looked at it, thought about it, and I was like, what the heck is he talking about? He said in there, and he was talking about this moving from being in love to being loving or loving. He said that Christ said a thing will not really live until it first dies. Where? Where did Christ say that? Where? Okay. So he's, he, he was paraphrasing some of it because it's, you read stuff like that. And actually I found, you know, Paul talks about the fact in 1 Corinthians, and I added it on the front there, Paul said, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless he dies. That's the only place where it specifically sort of gets into almost what, quoting what Lewis says. Now, Christ uses an analogy talking about the seed and growing, but it just, it was, it was hard. I could not find that exact, a thing will not really live until it first dies. So that's my point, is that this is not like a verse that he pulls out. He is talking about an entire theology of life that you're dying to yourself. This is one of those areas, sometimes you read that and he says, well, you know, as Christ said, a thing will not really live until it first dies. You know, back and forth, look up and down. Where does he say that? He doesn't say that. He lives it. It's... it's it's kind of what's in there in the Gospels. It's, it's, it's looking at the story of Christ. So what you're saying here is that what we would go through is correct about Christ. But he's pulling in his illustration of the weeds. He is. Yeah. yeah. But if you're looking for it as a quote somewhere that Jesus said. Not word for word. Yeah. You won't find that. You'll find the example in Christ how he lived and where going to the cross that's what he did but this is not specifically a phrase i think kyle bren said it in the final star wars movie if you take a look but not jesus i tried i looked all right then the last thing to talk about on here because it was my favorite part of this chapter because I said I know this is going to perk up people's ears and his whole discussion about submission agree disagree like it didn't Pam's not here. You can say what you think. There's no two people that work together in the same same Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. So so to cover all marriages with that statement, I don't think you can do it. I I think, I I definitely think there's a lot of individualism involved in thinking about it. And by individualism, I mean individual marriages and how the two people interact and how they come to a decision and how they, they work with one another. Um, I think a lot of people, I, I think there is a lot of truth in there. I, I, I do believe in male headship, um, but I think there's a lot of discussion that goes into that, that it's not just do what I say. Um, there's a lot more than that and it only works within a Christian context of love and respect and 
submission, being able to look at one another and subordinate your own desires for what is best for all involved. Yes, you can't look at it as, well, I'm the male, therefore I get my way. That was me. I... Well, well, absolutely. I don't think I said that, did I? No. Okay, I'm just making sure. You were looking pretty intensely at me, and I'm thinking, did I say that? Did somebody hear that? Yeah, she's getting her. I absolutely, very good. No, no. She was just getting ready to bore holes in the side of my head there. Like, what, 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 did I say that? No, no. I, yeah. But, the, but, but, you know, the world hears the church talking about things like this and submission and everybody working with one another, and the world, the world turns around and turns it into misogyny or, or it turns it into just conflict between the sexes because the world can't understand how that works. Absolutely. All right, well, nobody's going to get up and fight for this one, except possibly Mary, who may come after me later, but that's okay. Um, so we're making good progress. Next week, we get into a much happier chapter, forgiveness. Although you get to forgiveness after bad things happen, so maybe it's not all that happier. Um, any questions on this? All good so far? Everybody's still happy? Women, mama bear, yeah. I, I think he had a point there with some. I, I think in general it's true, but not in that case. There's absolutely always exceptions to the general. I mean, you speak in generalities, and there's always going to be at least one who's not. But yeah, I thought that was an interesting point there because that's what I wrote in the margins. There was mama bear, you know, and that's that's a very popular discussion now I mean it seems like everybody I know that's a mother is like don't mess with the mama bear okay and the guys are like whoa 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 let's slow down a little so <laughs> I was watching a video the other day that came up on my YouTube and it was some fight at a football game and it was between two women that were yelling and screaming and you could see the guy kind of back up a little bit and then they get going and suddenly the guys are jumping in to try to pull them apart it was uh, I don't know why that's so popular lately but a bunch of those types of videos keep winding up all over the place maybe it's because the world has gone crazy bread and circuses maybe we are all just reverting back to craziness again alright why don't we close with a word of prayer Father, thank you. Thank you for the marriages that you've given us here. Thank you for blessing us with partners that not only are in love with us, but that they love us and that we've been able to grow deeper in the relationships that we do have. Father, I ask you to bless us as we think about these things this week, as we prepare for the next session, and I ask that you just bless us as we head into this weekend. We pray for the pastor as he prepares his message to bring your word to us, and we just ask that you prepare our hearts to receive and to hear your word. These things we ask today in Jesus' name. Amen.